The sermon text this morning is Mark 12, 13 through 17. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them Or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. So it was on Tuesday, I was driving to work, coming down 540, newly paved, nice, nice road to drive on now. And uh, a truck passes me with a bumper sticker, and it says, uh, less government, more God. And I thought, well, I could be sympathetic to the, you know, the sentiment that the truck driver had, less government, more God. And I thought, that can be very confusing, though, because it, it can appear that is government and God at odds, or are they in an unhealthy tension? How does government and God work together. Well, it really brings up this idea of something I'm not supposed to talk about, which is religion and politics, and probably what I will talk about is religion and politics, but I want to do it in a way that, that gives wisdom from what Jesus has said about these things. You know, I think for the past six election seasons, I'll step out of whatever series I'm in and just remind ourselves of what's it mean to be members of two kingdoms, we are citizens in this country, and, and yet uh, many of us here who affirm, who love, who trust and rest in Jesus Christ, we're citizens of another kingdom, an eternal kingdom, a glorious kingdom. And how do they relate? They Usually, in most people's minds are in a unhealthy or at least confused tension. And I'm hoping to resolve that today. You know, the problems that we have with uh, government and God, so did Jesus confront these issues as as has just been read for us. Let me give you the context, though, in which Jesus was speaking. So here we are in Mark 12. We're kind of just parachuting into a gospel, so I want to give you a little context. You have Jesus has entered Jerusalem. He has entered to the cheers of the people. He has cleansed the temple. He's had three parables in which he has indicted the leadership of Israel as failed. They are moving against him in a series of three conflict stories. Ours is one of those. And in this conflict story, they are seeking to get him removed, ultimately uh, to have him killed. That's the, that's the desire that they have. And Jesus, of course, they're going to trap him. That's what you see in the first couple of verses. He's going to escape from that trap in 15 and 16, and then they're going to respond by marveling at him. So what I'd like to do today is just look at how they set the trap, how he escapes, and in his escape is where we draw this wisdom for the relationship between rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and rendering to God the things that are God's, and how do we live in that tension. And then I trust that we may... Marvel at him, but not marvel at his wit, but marvel at his glory and beauty and power and the eternal kingdom that he has come to bring. So that's how we're going to look at it. We're going to look at a trap has been set. You see that in 13 and 14. A trap will be sprung in 15 and 16 and part of 17, and then the people respond to that. So look with me at the trap being set, 13 and 14. 
And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. So it's clear. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you're true. You don't care about anyone's opinion, for you're not swayed by appearances, but you truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we, should we not? So let me just give you the players real quick. You got the Pharisees and the Herodians. These are two players that make up this trap. The Pharisees were the teachers of the law. They were religious zealots. They were the ones that called for ritual purity. They were the, the religious. They, they were narrow in their understanding uh, of scriptures. And they, were, they hated the Roman government. They hated the taxes. Um, they, were, they were very conservative. Then you have these Herodians. Herodians were supporting the reign of Herod, by extension, Rome. They tended to be liberal and accommodating. They relied on the taxes. So if you're kind of picking up what I'm putting down, you understand these are two opposite groups, both sides of the aisle. And yet what glues them together is their common hatred for Jesus Christ and the, and the, um, the trouble that he's bringing upon Israel. So they're coming together and they're going to set a trap. But they've got to soften the target first, right? So they, they give them this false flattery. Say things like, we know you're, that you speak the truth and you're not, ju- you know, you're not swayed by opinions and you're not easily you know, kind of confused by appearances. You teach the way of God. Now, ironically, all those things were true. They all were true, but you can see the deceit dripping by the question that follows. Is it lawful to pay taxes or not? And taxes really aren't the issue here. They're kind of the bait on the hook, if you will. The tax is just so that you understand, it's a, a poll tax. It was a tax charge on every adult Jewish, whether male or female, from 15 to 65. They were charged this tax. It wasn't a large sum of money. It was a denarius. It was one day's wage, call it $100, but they would have to pay it. Now, this tax was charged politically and religiously. I mean, politically, you're giving money to an opposing force in your country. So politically, it was a difficult tax, but religiously, it also, it was blasphemous to the Jew. Why? Well, a number of reasons. First, it had an image on the coin, this Daenerys, an image of the emperor. The second command is don't create any images, but also the the inscription on there. You know, Tiberius, son of divine Augustus, was printed on that. On the other side, high priest. So it's claiming deity violating the first commandment. So you see that this was not just a tax to be paid. This is an affront both to their political position as well as their uh, belief in God. Uh, But where's the trap? Well, the trap is in the question. If Jesus says it's lawful to pay these taxes, then he alienates himself with the religious. They were thinking he was a prophet of God. And what's he doing? Funneling money to a foreign government, a pagan government. But if he said, don't pay the taxes, well, then what will happen? Well, now he's seditious, rebellious, an insurrectionist. He's coming against Rome, and he'll have the wrath of Rome upon him. So either way, it's kind of like tails I win, head, or heads I win, tails you lose kind of scenario. He doesn't have a chance to win. It is amazing, though, how we can find ourselves collaborating with others that we're often opposed to for nefarious purposes. You see it right here. That's the trap they set. They wanted to alienate him, to eliminate him. Now, he will die by the end of this week. He'll be crucified. So in some ways, the trap worked, but but he sprung the trap. Look with me at 15 to 17. He says, But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. And they marveled at him. Now, before he answers, though, Jesus Christ knows what's in their heart. Why put me to the test, he says. Why put me to the test? I mean, he he knows the deceit. He knows that they're entrapping him. 
Uh, what I love about, about the way he exposes them is he says, uh, bring me a coin. He doesn't have one. If it's so blasphemous, he doesn't have one. They do. I mean, they have one ready at hand. Again, kind of convicting and exposing their hypocrisy. When he says whose inscription is or whose image is on this, they say Caesar's. And this is when he brings forth this incredible line, then give to Caesar. What is Caesar's? Give to God what's God. Do you know he didn't speak about its lawfulness? He just says render, or the word means to give. In other words, repay, give back what is owed to Caesar and give what is owed to God. Now, by doing this, I want you to see that he is giving a moral legitimacy to the state, to the government. He's giving them a legitimate right, that there are things that we as citizens of a kingdom ought to give back to the government over us. But you also are to render to God. God is second. Why? Well, that's a place of primacy in that the government given, the authority given to the government is less than the authority given to God. In other words, he's, he's giving not primacy of place to Caesar. There's someone beyond Caesar. So Caesar is limited. Jesus is limiting the authority given to human government that it is underneath God. But there's more going on here. This is really a revolutionary thing he has said. What Jesus is doing here is he's not just giving moral legitimacy to the government, but he's showing that there's a change in order here because he's telling the Jew who only saw government as a theocracy of Israel, he's saying, no, there's a moral legitimacy to submitting to a government that is not godly. He's showing that the kingdom Jesus is bringing is transnational. It's transcultural. One author said it this way, Jesus' approval of paying taxes to Rome was revolutionary. By this, Jesus shows that the legitimacy of a government is not determined by whether it supports the worship of one true God or even allows for it. By Jesus not requiring those who follow him only to support states which are formally allied to the true God, as Old Testament Israel had done, Jesus unhitches his followers from any particular nation. This is huge. He is making obsolete the ethnic phase of God's plan. He's saying now there's a legitimacy to serve or to be under the authority of any government, even though it may not be allied with God or even allow God to be worshipped. In other words, Jesus' kingdom is something now that transcends human government. This can be made up not by national boundaries or not by ethnicity, but it's made up by faith of people who follow Christ. This was in fulfillment of the promise made to Isaiah, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Do you see what he's saying? Isaiah had promised that the Messiah would come and the government would be upon him. He would be establishing a new government that would no longer be teased out along ethnic or national lines, but that would be by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we are living in an age, though, that is in tension. He has not come to establish his perfect government right now. We, we live in the time waiting for this. And so how ought we to live? And I think that's what he's getting to here. When he's saying, render to Caesar, while waiting for his kingdom to come in its fullness, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, render to God the things that are God's. So I want to tease that out for you with a number of implications here. First, what does it mean to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's? Well, as I said, I think there is a, a, a moral legitimacy of the state to exist, that Jesus is affirming the existence of the state, that God has in fact ordained 
the state to carry out a degree of authority over a people. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. A government has always been part of God's creation. In the beginning, with Adam and Eve, they were made, male and female, he made them. He gave them rights to, to subdue, to multiply, to exercise dominion. That is government. But we see governments in our family, between parents and children. We see a government within the marriage, between the husband and the wife. We see government in the church with elders and deacons and members. We see government in nations. We see government in communities. You even see government in creation. The sun governs the, the pathway of the planets around it. So God has established government. What shocks us in this passage is that he has given moral legitimacy to a pagan government, to a wicked government. God is sovereign over that. All governments are subsumed under God. Jesus has given, he has given moral legitimacy to governments that don't even come to power in lawful ways. I'm not saying God sanctions fraudulent elections, but if God is sovereign, even those are brought up under him. Think of Jesus before King Herod in John 19, 11. He said, you would have no authority over me if it wasn't given to you from above. He was hardly voted lawfully. Paul picks this up in Romans 13, 1. He says, let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. So there is that right for the state to exist. So we don't want to move in such a direction that we deny the state a right to exist in this world. Even as a Christian, as a member of God's kingdom, there are human kingdoms, there are human governments. Uh, but secondly, we are to submit to this authority. We're called to submit. Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And notice what he's saying. Submit in paying taxes. Uh, the taxes that are to be paid aren't simply for those things that we deem moral. When Jesus said, render to Caesar this poll tax, he knew that that money would go into the coffers of Rome, which would fund a godless government, build pagan temples, and pay the soldiers who would crucify him. And yet he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Paul again picks this up in Romans 13. Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. That's to the government, even the Roman government. Now, friends, uh, submitting to the government, there is, of course, a clear disclaimer to make. When the government moves with command uh, to the Christian to live or to act or to behave in a way contrary to God's expressed law, then there is a call to resist. There's a call to disobey that. Or if it crosses, crosses our conscience, a conscience informed by God's word, not by political theory or economic theory, but by God's word that we are to resist. And again, we have this example in Acts chapter 4 and 5 when John and Peter were instructed not to teach or preach in the name of Jesus. And Peter clearly said, no, we must obey God rather than man. So when there's conflict, God wins that argument. So we don't submit. But in the other things, there is rendering to Caesar is by us following. Uh, but there's other things that you see come in the scriptures regarding our responsibility to Caesar. It would be to be grateful for the role that God has established government with. Uh, that is the role for our good. Uh, now, governments exist uh, to provide peacefulness so that Lives can thrive, businesses can exist, upkeep roads, establish courts for justice. There, no, no government does this perfectly. Uh, but I think we can be grateful in many ways for our government, you know, as we do drive down 540 and it's nice and paved. They do things, they provide security, a measure. There is no perfect government. Friends, you know, it, it took for Carol and I, when we lived overseas for a couple of years in missions, lived in Austria, and uh, we were there two months after the Iron Curtain came down. So it was still very much communism, 
just to our east. And we would go across the border into what was Czechoslovakia. I know it's split, but it was Czechoslovakia at the time. We would go there and do evangelism and outreach. I mean, you, it was just probably less than 60 days after the wall came down. You drive into communist Czechoslovakia, and it is significant. Just cement, apartments, uh, landscape, untended, roads terrible, cars disastrous, difficult to get gas, hard to get food. And I remember the first time coming out of Czechoslovakia, standing at the border, we had to get out and be inspected by the Austrian guards. And I look at Austria, paved roads, traffic lights at work, single family houses, painted, flowers, Look to the left, communism. There are cement buildings. No fl- Clearly, governments can play an incredibly important role for our good. Friends, it's, the, it's in the preamble to our Constitution. Let me remind you. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Do ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States of America. This was coming out of the scriptures. That is the role of government. We are to be grateful to the degree that our government can do that. But not just do we, do we thank and are grateful for the government, but we also want to engage in it, participate in it, steward the rights that we have. Friends, we are the church. We are the salt and light, the conscience of the government, speaking to the issues that we see and and engaging either with agreement or disagreement over those issues. We can participate. You know, some issues, immigration policy, foreign policy, these are very, very difficult. But there are some issues that are very clear, the right to life for the unborn. Uh, We want to participate and engage in our government over these issues. We want to vote. I encourage you to vote, to look at the issues, to line them up with your understanding of God and the scriptures and vote accordingly. In the 16 elections, only 33% of evangelicals voted. The smallest percentage were from the 18 to 24 range. This is a, a responsibility we have to engage in. But we we also want to honor the government. You know, in 1 Peter 2.17, he says, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. To what degree do, do I mean by honor? I don't mean you agree with everything, and I surely don't mean that you shouldn't engage in robust debate over these issues. But may our rhetoric not be demonizing and villainizing a sat, uh, and really producing character assassinations, particularly on social platforms. Uh, We want to speak in a way that is recognizing they wouldn't have that authority if it wasn't given to them by God above. So we want to speak in a way that is truthful but respectful. Take issue with policy, but we don't necessarily need to assassinate character. And then, then I would also say, To pray for the government is another way to render Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Are we praying for their competence to do their jobs well? Are we praying for their wisdom to enact right laws? Are we praying for their fairness uh, in carrying out justice? Are we praying for their humility, knowing that they'll stand before God for the authority that they have been given? We're not looking at them to be spiritual leaders. We're not looking at them as some pastor-in-chief. No, they are often secular governors, and we're going to pray for them to govern well. Paul tells us this, of course, in 1 Timothy, I urge then, first of all, requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Do you hear what Paul's saying? It is good. God is pleased when we pray for them. Labor. God, 
move circumstantially. God in the past has used Darius to fund a temple. He's used Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment upon nations. God can raise up kings and he can set kings down. Our responsibility to render to Caesar is to pray for their well-governance and not to place expectations on them that we can't sow. So are you rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's? Are you being a good citizen? This is where we start. In the church, we start with ourselves. It's easy to castigate all those around us, but, but let's just start with ourselves. I think, I think that's what Jesus is getting at when he says that, you know, about the, you know, kind of the speck in someone's eye and the plank in our own. The speck needs to come out. I mean, if any of you have had a speck or an eyelash in your eye, it hurts. We just want to take the beam out of ours. That's where we start, and then we move to bring about right correction to others. But have we, been, have we been grateful for the government that we do have and for the things that they are able to do? Have we been prayerful? Have we spoken with honor and respect? Taking issue with policy, hear me clearly on that, but doing it in a way you know, that honors Paul's words of let nothing unwholesome come out of your mouth except that which is building up and edifying, giving grace to the hearer. So have we done that? Maybe, maybe we start, even before this election, with our own repentance, our own sense of coming before God. I, I haven't been grateful. I haven't been prayerful. I haven't been honoring. I haven't been submissive in my heart, even though I may have in my actions. So let's start with ourselves. Friends, we can do this because of the gospel. We are able to admit who we are and where we are with God because we know that Jesus Christ has said it is finished, that the forgiveness that we have is legitimate, it's clear, it's complete. So may we walk rightly before our God as we walk before our government. But notice what Jesus ends with. He ends with, but render to God the things that are God. Now, this is where we just feel this, the tempo just increase here. You render to God the things that are God's. What's he speaking about here? Well, you know, it was the image on the coin which identified its ownership. Well, Jesus, without saying it, made a clear implication. Whose image do you bear? What image do you bear? The coin had an image stamped on it. You have had an image stamped on you. What image is stamped on you? Genesis 1, 27. We hear what image. He says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Do you realize when Jesus said this, can you imagine the silence? I mean, you render to God the things that are God. After saying, what image does the coin bear? What icon does it bear? What image do we bear? We bear the image of God. What would that mean? Uh, tease that out with me. That means we are owed to God. We, like ourselves, are our beings. In other words, coming to church on Sunday morning, I love seeing you and I encourage it wholeheartedly. This is hardly Rendering to God the things that are God is a starting place, no doubt, an important thing to do. But when he says render to God, he's saying render your lives to him. Give him all of yourself. The government, they may get some taxes, they may get some, you know, you're agreeing with, to live within some of their laws. Uh, but in this context, he's saying you render all of yourself to God. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, what I'm talking about is not just your body. I'm talking about the things, the gifts that you have, the talents that you have, the treasures that you have, whatever footprint you have in this world. It's all God's, right? I mean, I mean, none of us chose the day we'd be born. We didn't choose the gender. We didn't choose height. We didn't choose weight, parents, eye color. We didn't choose any of it, right? We're not going to determine the day we die. He, he appoints the days that have been apportioned to us before one came to be. So, so this, is, this is what Jesus is grabbing us, really, and, and putting smelling salts under our nose. You, you're really rendering yourself to him because he owns us, all of us. 
Abraham Kuyper was a Dutch statesman. He was a theologian. He was an educator. In the inaugural address at the beginning of Free University in Amsterdam, many of you know what he has said in his address. He says, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine, mine. Now, for the Christian here, I think this doesn't, this makes sense to you. You remember the words of Jesus? What are we often most worried about? What we're going to eat and drink and wear. And yet he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, drink, or wear. He says, you seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Same kind of line. To what degree do you see yourself rendering yourself to God? When you look at your life, when you look at your time, your willingness to be inconvenienced, the money you have, the gifts you have, to what degree are you rendering yourself to God? And even if you're here and you're not a Christian, I'm, I'm grateful that you are here. It's a difficult place to often come. But do you realize that you bear the same image that we bear? Every male and female in this room, you bear the image. You're vast, vastly different than all of creation. You have relational capacities no other created thing has. You have moral capacities, understanding right and wrong. You have capacities to understand eternality. You know that there is something beyond, even though you can't describe it or perhaps even fully understand it. You have spiritual capacities. No other creation has this. We bear his image. And even for you as a non-Christian, you are owed to God. And you will stand before him one day and make account for how you have rendered yourself to God. And Christian, likewise. Friends, this should cause us to pause and probably sit down, maybe take a deep breath. Now, this is where the gospel is such aid, <clears throat> not just to the Christian, but to those who are considering Christianity. See, in the gospel, we find that God does not remain aloof outside of human government, kind of in a safe spot for himself. But he sends his own son, as promised, to enter our world, to be born of a woman, to be born under the law, to be born under human government. And he renders himself completely to God, even to death. And the full rendering of Jesus Christ, this is the gospel story. This is what all of Scripture is driving towards and from which all of Scripture is rejoicing over in the table that we celebrate even today. He has come to render himself by carrying on him our sin, bearing the curse of God for failing, for us failing to render ourselves to him in fullness so that we might be forgiven, that we might be adopted, that we might be reconciled. This is the gospel. This is what we must believe. Repenting of our sins, believing in Jesus Christ, this is how we are reconciled to God. Friends, I, I hope you see that rendering yourselves to God begins by coming to him in repentance and faith, being forgiven, being adopted, being drawn into God's family. But there's other things that we need to do that follow that in rendering ourselves to God. It is our affections, rendering our affections to God. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. To what degree are our affections growing to God? We may be very dutiful in our, in our walking out what we understand the Christian life to be. I'm encouraged by many of you in your faithfulness. Are your affections growing as well? Is our relationship with God kind of like that marriage that they're kind of together, but you don't know if they really love each other? Has our love increased for God this year? Has your appreciation for his character, his beauty, his glory? Has your thoughts of Christ matured into a deeper love that affects your obedience and willingness to walk in holiness, not because you have to, but because you want to? Has our love increased, or have there been other things 
that distract us from our affections. Or maybe, maybe you're here today and this is the first time you've heard that, that affections are part of this Christian walk where we ought to be. Do I love him as he loves me? You know, that many distractions, one distraction that comes around this time of year for us is politics. Andrew Fuller was a Baptist uh, pastor, English pastor in the 18th century, theologian. And uh, he wrote a book called Backslider, and he speaks about how many people who once were zealous and excited about God can tend to lose that enthusiasm and excitement over time. And he says this, that one of the main culprits in his world or in his book was taking an eager and deep interest in political disputes. He saw politics he said, has a distinctive power over the human imagination that uniquely competed for this ultimate supremacy within the soul. He says, when a man's thoughts and affections are filled with such things as these politics, the scriptures become kind of a dead letter. While the speeches and writings of politicians are the lively oracles, to what degree has our interest, maybe our fear in politics, taken over and almost replaced, or at least kind of diluted our enthusiasm for the God who stands over our human government, rejoicing in him? So rendering to God the things that are God means our own love. Uh, but also rendering to God the things that are God, it also speaks to our doing good for others. You know, the second command, like the first, love the Lord your God with your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, Jeremiah the prophet even told the exiles in Babylon, in Jeremiah, he says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Friends, our responsibility to rendering to God the things that are God is using the gifts and the talents that we have for others. Uh, rather than simply complaining about the deterioration of our government, are we, are we in fact seeking to be both a, a voice and a hand for help and encouragement? And then, and then last, rendering to God, the things that are God, would be this, and this is critically important, that your hope would be anchored to the gospel, not to the government. That your hope would be anchored to the gospel, not to the government. Let me explain what I mean. Governments can't change people. They can curb behavior. They can't change anyone. Uh, governments come and governments go. Political solutions always disappoint. Whenever the church has tried to wed itself to the power of government, it has always come at the expense of the gospel and its witness. There is to be a degree of separation between these, that we're not to look to the government for things. Even now, while we can, we can look to the government to provide security and justice and equity, I don't anchor my hope there. Our hope for change cannot come from a new administration. They'll be replaced four years later. Our hope has to come from the gospel, the gospel living in us and us declaring it to others. That's the only means of change. Governments are made of men and women. We have enough history to see this. J.C. Raw writes, the best of men is only men at their very best. The best of men are only men at their very best. I want us to love our country. I want us to be good citizens. But I want us to remember that most, and at least place of primacy, is rendering to God the things that are God. And God has brought about change for this world. He's brought about redemption, not by giving a perfect government. That will come when the perfect comes. And we are to long for that. But 
change will only come through the gospel. And are we willing to work hard to declare this gospel to see change? Or at least let's work as hard at declaring the gospel as we are hoping for change to come through a new administration. Now, friends, every election you see, I speak about being a good citizen before the election and then after election, guess what I preach on? The sovereignty and the goodness of God who will lead his people to where they need to be. I book and these elections so that we would be right-minded as a people, not caught up in fear and frenzy regardless that we will pray if a Democrat's in office, we'll pray if a Republican's in office, we're going to pray if a Libertarian's in office, but we're going, to, we're going to pray to God. Now, how do you respond to this? When they heard Jesus say, render to Caesar and render to God, what'd they do? They marveled. In, in Matthew's gospel, it says they were amazed. In Luke's gospel, it says they were silent. How do you respond to this? Are you agitated that I didn't speak more to a certain part of your platform? Are you overly concerned over what might come on Tuesday? What do you, what's the impression on your soul right now? Would you join with me in trusting the sovereign one over the universe who can set kings up? He can change the hearts of king like he changes the courses of rivers. This is the God that we worship. This is the God that we call Father. This is the God who has given us a son that has laid down his life for us. And it really does bring us to the table. And I want to try to give you a different picture of the table for just a minute. I think this table declares a political truth. This table declares that we are now a body politic of Jesus. We're a new community. We're part of a new kingdom. We're longing for a perfect government to come. The meal explains how this happens, that when the elder holds the bread up and breaks it, that is reminding you of that day when Jesus Christ bore our sins and his body was broken under the weight of our sins. Friends, when you see that bread broken, would you look and be, if you're a Christian here, would you celebrate with me that the guilt and the shame that we have created by our sins has been taken care of by him. And when you look at the cup, the cup is reminding us of the blood that was shed, and the blood that was shed established a new covenant, a better covenant. Not a covenant as in the Old Testament with the blood of bulls and goats that would have to be repeated every year. You know, that symbol, that sacrificing of the animals, that was getting us ready for the perfect to come when it would be sacrificed once to take away sins to bring us to God. And so we look at that blood and we say, I am now not just forgiven, but I'm adopted. I'm drawn into a new family, no longer marked by human distinctions, but marked by the spirit, the spirit, that new age of the spirit. And you can celebrate that, that we bear our sin and shame no more. Why? He hung there naked for us, bearing the shame of our sins. May we not carry it after he has carried it. But really, the table is giving you a new identity. We're going to gather around. Now, why do I say it's a political statement here? The gospel is completely political. A kingdom is coming within human kingdoms to establish a new kingdom. And that's what this table is about. And so every month we celebrate this, reminding ourselves we're part of a kingdom that is eternal and will last forever. We have freedom to participate in whatever government is over us. We're not threatened by that. Why? Because we're part of a kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We are part of a government that has Christ as our king. Our eating and drinking, for on this side of heaven, our eating and drinking is to remind us that no government can create a utopia. No government can fix people. No, it's, it's this kingdom right here that changes people that fixes people. We'll be faithful to the end 
by his grace. But this is a political statement you're making. People lost their lives for not worshiping the gods of the Roman government because they had allegiance to one king. So when you come forward, you're really making a political statement. You're saying, my allegiance, I will render to the government the things that I am, but I'm giving everything I have to the God that has sent a son to save. So let's take a moment and let's just ask God for grace to convict us of sin, not as a reminder of our failure, but as a reminder of the forgiveness that we have. And then I will pray for us in a moment and then we will prepare to come forward. Let's just take a moment now. Friends, hear these words of encouragement and assurance. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, that your kindness and your mercy and your grace would be felt upon our souls even now in a palpable way, that for those who bear your name, they would receive the joy of knowing that the Son, who is the judge of all mankind, who did lay down his life, who was raised for our justification, has said, it is finished. So may we celebrate him and his great work I pray in the name of Jesus, amen.